the Zaid Rod Al Hussein, United Nations High Commissioner of Human Rights. The subject, how private central banks, private ledger credit creation, and interest on simple loan contracts violate General Assembly Resolution 2200A. Upon reading the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, also known as General Assembly Resolution 2200A, I realize that the Federal Reserve System, private ledger credit creation, and exacting interest on simple loan contracts violates this resolution. Part 1, Article 1.1 1 .1 of this resolution states, Quote, All peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Unquote. To begin, I wish to examine the word self-determination. According to www.dictionary.com, there are three definitions. Number one, quote, Determination by oneself or itself without outside influence. Unquote. Number two, quote, freedom to live as one chooses or to act or decide without consulting another or others. Unquote. Number three, quote, the determining by the people of the form their government shall have without reference to the wishes of any other nation especially by the people of a territory or former colony. Unquote. Sir, the Federal Reserve System in the United States of America violates the first two definitions. In addition, it can be argued that the international bankers violate the third definition. You may ask, how does the Federal Reserve System violate the first definition? In order to answer that question, we must understand how the Federal Reserve System is structured. The Federal Reserve System consists of a board of governors which are selected by the executive and legislative branches of the United States federal government and a Federal Advisory Council which consists of the directors of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks who in turn are selected by the shareholders. Of these two bodies it is the Federal Advisory Council that actually controls the Federal Reserve System. Since 1914, the citizens of the United States have been unable to purchase shares in the 12 Federal Reserve Banks, thus they have not been able to participate in the appointment of these directors. However, since 1914, according to Eustace Mullins, seven firms possess shares in the Federal Reserve Banks. These firms are Rothschild & Company, Wizard, Kuhn Loeb & Company, M. M. Warburg & Company, Lehman Brothers, the Goldman Sachs Group Incorporated, and J.P. Morgan Chase. Of these seven firms, four of them are foreign to the United States of America. Thus it must be asked, do not foreign entities which possess a 4 to 3 ratio of private ownership of the Federal Reserve System constitute being, quote, an outside influence, unquote. Does this not in turn violate the first definition of the word self-determination? Now I will go on to the second definition of the word self-determination. Is it not a violation of the second definition when the Board of Governors, which is selected by the Federal Government of the United States of America, which in turn is selected by the American people, must consult the Federal Advisory Council, which is selected predominantly by foreigners, to determine the financial slash economic destiny of the citizens of the United States. While it is true that the international bankers are not a colonial power, it can, as previously stated, be argued that they violate the third definition of the word self-determination. Sir, you may inquire as to how they are able to achieve this. The answer is simple. Shell corporations. Shell corporations allow them to do two things. Number one, procure shares of media corporations, which in turn determine the success of candidates during elections. Number two, procure shares in other corporations, 
which in turn form lobbies that push legislation contrary to the interests of the general public. The result? The determination of the American people as to what form they want their government, without reference to foreigners, is subverted. Part 2, Article 11.1 states, quote, The state's parties to the present covenant recognize the right of everyone to an adequate standard of living for himself and his family, including adequate food, clothing, and housing, and to the continuous improvement of living conditions. The state's parties will take appropriate steps to ensure the realization of this right, recognizing to this effect the essential importance of international cooperation based on free consent. Unquote. Part 2, Article 11.2 states, quote, The state's parties to the present covenant, recognizing the fundamental right of everyone to be free from hunger, shall take individually and through international cooperation the measures including specific programs which are needed. Unquote. These are the ways in which these two points of Article 11 of this resolution are violated. Number 1. When the money changers are allowed to create ledger credit and slash or produce the legal tender of a nation, this leads to both price inflation and deflation of the money supply. The former, price inflation, makes the citizenry work longer and harder for less while paying more for goods and services. The latter, deflation of the money supply, prevents the citizenry from creating or sustaining enterprises, thus leading to destitution. Sir, I must ask, will this grant a person an adequate standard of living? How is it great that a person has to work longer and harder for less money, while being demanded to pay more for goods and services with the little money that they have? How is it great that personal survival depends upon the whims of the money changers, who are both indifferent and unaccountable? Number two, the last question posed in number one presents another. How are the citizens of the United States of America able to pursue improvement in their living conditions when they are at the mercy of the money changers? When the citizenry is prospering, the money changers crash the economy by refusing to issue ledger credit. Thus the citizenry, who were working towards improvement in their standard of living, are forced back to where they started. In other words, sir, the American people are placed in a position where they are futilely striving for improvement. Number three, with the practice of exacting interest on simple loan contracts, two things occur, price inflation and capital costs. Price inflation itself occurs in two ways. A, when the government of a nation borrows its own money from private central banks, it must print more money than necessary to satisfy the interest exacted upon the previous loans. B, even if the government were to print its own money, it would still have to contend with the deflationary effects of interest exacted upon simple loan contracts to the citizenry. Simply put, the government must print more money than necessary to make up for creditors taking more currency out of circulation than they are putting in. I've already stated the effects of price inflation upon the common people, thus it would be redundant for me to repeat it here. In regards to capital costs, there are two things that occur, destruction of labor and greater expense for the consumer. Interest upon simple loan contracts leads to enterprises being placed in a no-win situation. In order to satisfy the loans, they must either A. Take out more loans, B. Decrease expenditures. If they choose the former, taking out more loans, it will lead to greater debt. If they choose the latter, decreasing expenditures, then it will lead often, to layoffs, elimination of employee benefits, and slash or decrease in wages. If enterprises choose neither to take out more loans or decrease expenditures, then they will raise the price of goods and services in order to make up for the interest upon the simple loan contracts. The late Margaret Kennedy affirms this in her book, Interest in Inflation-Free Money, when she wrote that 45% of the prices of goods and services are interest. Simply put, sir, the consumer is forced to suffer more price inflation, interest being paid by enterprises, on top of price inflation, interest being paid by the government. 
With these consequences, it can be deduced that interest on simple loan contracts makes it difficult for one to obtain an adequate amount of food, which directly violates, quote, the right of everyone to be free from hunger, unquote. It is hard to not experience hunger when your wages are lowered and prices are increased. Part 2, Article 12.1 states, quote, The state's parties to the present covenant recognize the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, unquote. I will not address this point extensively due to indirectly stating how the standard of living has diminished for 97% of the global population under private central banks, private ledger credit creation, and exacting interest on simple loan contracts. Under these practices, I have spotted three immediate ways in which, quote, physical and mental health, unquote, of the individual is impacted. Number one, due to trying to obtain a sufficient amount of money to survive, the individual selects work over attending to his physical well-being, for example, adequate amounts of rest. Number two, if the individual is not working multiple jobs to obtain sufficient amounts of money to survive, then they will seek to lower their expenditures. This leads to the individual purchasing cheap, often unhealthy food, rather than purchasing expensive, often healthier food, thus leading to weight gain and the development of ailments. Number three, Due to social, for example, balancing work and relationships, and financial, for example, working multiple jobs to satisfy creditors and utilities, pressures, this leads to the individual becoming psychologically distraught, for example, stressed, depressed, suicidal, etc. Part 2, Article 12.2 and subpoints A through C states, quote, the steps to be taken by the state's parties to the present covenant to achieve full realization of this right shall include those necessary for a. the provision for the reduction of the stillbirth rate and of infant mortality and for the healthy development of the child b. the improvement of all aspects of environment and industrial hygiene c. the prevention, treatment, and control of epidemic, endemic, occupational, and other diseases d. The creation of conditions which will assure to all medical service and medical attention in the event of sickness. Unquote. In regards to subpoint A, the money changers are guilty of committing child mortality and, if the child survives, impeding their healthy development. In Canto 45, monetary reformer Ezra Pound states that exacting interest on simple loan contracts is the primary cause of abortion. Sir, you may inquire as to how this is possible. The answer is simple. Due to interest decreasing wages slash purchasing power of money, increasing the price of goods and services, and deterring entrepreneurs from taking out loans to create slash sustain businesses, jobs, many are made incapable of raising offspring. This notion is affirmed when the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, USCCB, found that 73-81% to 81 of abortions are motivated by poverty. I must ask, does this not make the money changers guilty of indirectly murdering the offspring of these mothers? To rephrase it, does this not make the money changers guilty of genocide? In regards to subpoint B, the money changers are guilty of making governments incapable of undertaking public works, such as improving or preserving the sanitation of communities. Sir, you may assert, and correctly so, that governments that choose to borrow money from the international bankers instead of creating their own national sovereign currency are at fault. But we must ask, do they really have a choice? If a nation does not submit to the international bankers, then their fate will be similar to National Socialist Germany, Iraq, and Libya. Simply put, you either play along or you get bombed. In regards to subpoint C and D, the money changers are guilty of spraying disease. There are three ways in which this is done. Number one, pushing legislation that is contrary to the interests of the general public. For example, Big Pharma. Number two, preventing public works. Number three, capital costs. 
Due to already writing extensively about these topics in previous paragraphs, I shall not repeat myself here, but I will say this. Interest makes it difficult to start or sustain a medical facility. It also increases the prices for medical care, thus diminishing the quantity and quality of treatments. These conditions violate the statement, quote, the creation of conditions which would assure to all such medical services and attention that is needed in the event of sickness, unquote. Conclusion Sir, I am writing to humbly request that you publicly acknowledge before both the members of the United Nations and the people of the world that private central banks, private ledger credit creation, and exacting interest on simple loan contracts are violations of the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, also known as General Assembly Resolution 2200A. Sincerely, Taylor Pope Williams, Member of Christians Against Usury.